So um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for listening. And, um, setup I want to talk about is uh, where we start with some arithmetic lattice inside SON, comma 1. Um, so I like hyperbolic manifolds, so this is where we'll start. Cool. So there's some uh, ambient number field and ring of integers there. I'm not really going to reference that, but OK. So the generality I want to allow is that we'll pass to is a risky dense um, subgroup of uh, gamma. So this means that gamma can, uh, for, uh, lambda can be um, an infinite index subgroup of SL2Z, for example. And I need to impose, um, I want to do spectral theory, so I need to impose that lambda is uh, geometrically finite. So in dimension two, for n is two, this just means finitely generated. And in higher dimensions, it means that the fundamental domain for the action of lambda on hyperbolic space is finitely faced. So there's no infinite geometry at infinity. Um, Okay, so I have uh, this ambient uh, ring of integers, and I'm going to define lambda of n to be the kernel of reduction mod n, where n is some ideal. Uh, I'll, t I'll talk about the case where um, gamma is SL2z, and then n is just really a number. Um, okay, so then I have this, uh, this picture of covering spaces where I set x to be the quotient of hyperbolic space by lambda, and it's covered by x of n, and the deck transformation group is lambda mod lambda n. And I'll con um, consider Laplace polytomy operators on these uh, two spaces. So the thing to notice is that, say you have some eigenvalue on x for the Laplacian, and there's some corresponding eigenfunction. This will lift to the covering space. So for every piece of, uh, every eigenvalue that you have downstairs, you'll have it upstairs. So the question is, well, what new stuff is there? OK, so let's. Um, the question I'm going to address in this talk. How did I click forward? Um, OK, so let me give you some motivation. So the first piece of motivation is a direct application. So um, this is the Borgian gambert sarnak aff affine sieve. Um, OK, so the example I want to give here is where lambda is um, infinite index subgroup, potentially, of SL2Z. Um, so because it's, uh, a linear, it's a subgroup of a linear group, it acts on uh, vectors in Z squared. So I can, so there'll be some orbit, right? Lambda dot this vector is some set of things in Z squared. And if I have some polynomial F, I can put this uh, orbit into F and see what comes out. <coughs> okay, so I get some subset of integers. And then the theorem, so I put this loosely, but the theorem of Borgian, Gabbard, and Sarnak um, is that if you have strong uniform spectral estimates for the covering spaces, you get lower and upper bounds for the number of r almost primes in this orbit. So what's here? Um, this is a ball of radius r around the identity inside lambda. So you take some ball inside your group, and you see what um, polynomial values you get on this ball. So one thing I haven't clarified is what is the metric on my group? So the two metrics you might like to consider are uh, like a, a combinatorial metric where you take word length or um, an arc, uh, like an Archimedean kind of thing where you, like, you, liter you literally measure the size of the elements of the, the group. So for those two different interpretations of balls, um, for the Archimedean interpretation, you need to look at the Laplace Beltrami operator. That's the right thing to do. Okay. So my second m piece of motivation is that these questions are actually classical. Um, so let me give you the spectral theory. I'm going to set lambda to be equal to gamma to be SL2Z. So I'm talking about the modular curve and the covering spaces. So let's just talk about the base manifold or orbifold for now. So you have absolutely continuous spectrum from a quarter up. You do have these embedded eigenvalues of, this, of the Laplacian. These are the mass forms. And then well, maybe there could be stuff there, but it's a result of Huxley that there isn't anything for the base manifold. So what can happen is that anything embedded does lift, and there is new stuff. And in fact, conjecturally, there is new stuff at a quarter. But the question is, you know, is there new stuff here? So Selbrook conjectured that you never get anything below a quarter, which is still open. At the same time, he proved that there is a gap um, at 3 on 16. And the best to date is by Kim and Sarnak, which is that 
you never get anything below 975 over 4096. Um, oh, that's kind of incredible. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about the infinite volume cases. So in order to do that, I need to um, draw this picture. So I take a point in hyperbolic space, and I look at the orbit under lambda. Lambda is discrete, so it doesn't have any accumulation points inside, but you know, my picture is compact, so I get accumulation points on the boundary. And I write uh, L of lambda for this limit set. So if you're infinite co-volume and you're not trapped in any proper algebraic subgroup, then you have this associated Hausdorff dimension, which is strictly between 0 and m minus 1, which is the dimension of the m minus 1 sphere. So I've got this gauge of how thin or thick the group is. If it's thin inside uh, the arithmetic lattice, then I have, a, I have a number that tells me how thin it really is. So I can give you the, the infinite volume spectral theory. Um, let's just deal with the absolutely continuous spectrum first. It's from the same point upwards. Um, and it doesn't, in this case, you don't have any embedded eigenvalues by result of Lax and Phillips. The bottom of the spectrum, so this is when delta is bigger than the halfway point. The bottom of the spectrum is given by the Hausdorff dimensional limit set at delta times m minus 1 minus delta. And then a result of Lax and Phillips says there's finitely many, there's finitely many things in this range. And then they'll lift in the covering spaces. But the question is, can you find a gap here so, so that there's never anything new near the bottom of the spectrum for some epsilon? Um, so Alex Gambard proved for n is 2, so the case of Riemann surfaces, that there, you can do this whenever the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set is big enough. So that, that's saying that the infinite, infinite volume manifold looks, is close enough in some sense to actually being, you know, it's. Delta is, for n is 2, delta is 1 uh, for fi finite co-volume stuff. So delta being large enough is like you're starting to look close to, you know, in some sense. And then it's, um, it's my thesis whenever uh, n is bigger than or equal to 3. And it says that there's, so the power of this theorem is that everything's explicit. There's some explicit delta naught such that when you're larger than delta naught, you have explicit, an explicit uh, spectral gap. Um, and these explicit results uh, feed into the affine sieve to give you explicit ex estimates for uh, our almost primes. OK, so when did I start? <laughs> oh, OK. So, yeah, so the interesting thing is the techniques that you have uh, available to control the spectrum. Um, so you're in this uh, locally symmetric setting. So you have access to trace formula. So very loosely speaking, the trace formula has some sum over spectral data, the analytic side, and then you have something geometric. Okay. Um, so if you have strong geometric information about the covering spaces, um, this in practice amounts to uniform lattice point counting. You can feed it in on this side and then hope to uh, get something on this side. If you choose like F positive and to be large in some range, you can amplify at the place where you want to forbid something and then, you know, hope this works out. So uh, what's working against you there is the uncertainty principle. But okay, you can do something. But if you just do this, it's because you have like an uncertainty principle, you're never going to get a spectral gap coming straight out of the trace formula. It's only going to give you bounds for multiplicities. So this was all started off by like D, D. George and Wallach. And then there was a lot of work on like limit multiplicities. But OK, there, there is a, there's a bonus fact, which is that if you get a new eigenvalue, it belongs to a non-trivial representation of the deck transformation group, right? So that will be like a multiplicity that will appear here. And you actually know what the deck transformation group is by, um, in the very general case, um, strong approximation by a uh, vice father. And in the classical cases, you you just you can just prove you can just prove that it, it it's as big as it it's as big as it um, could be. You know it's a finite um, Chevalier group up to some maybe a center or something. And then you have this property that. These groups have no small dimensional, non-trivial, irreducible representations. 
Um, so this is like a property that GARS is like quantified and called quasi-randomness. Um, okay. So that the whole thing is that you're getting some multiplicity bound, and then you're also adding in something which says that if it does occur, it has a high multiplicity, then you're ruling out that it can occur at all. Um, so this quasi-randomness is like used in a lot of places where you establish expansion. Um, it's normally the first step where you use, these, um, use this property to establish mixing on some scale, and then you have to do something harder, but this, this, this shows up all over the place in the subject. Um, okay. So that's the trace formula, and it, it's kind of limited. Um, second technique that you have is the transfer. So I think Brooks started this, and then there's more elaborate examples in the paper of Borghi and Gambert and Sarnak, uh, even going beyond like L2 theory. But the idea is that the covering space is you know, tiled by fundamental domains for the base manifold, and the structure of this tiling is given by uh, the Cayley graph associated to, you take the side pairing congruences for the fundamental domain on the base manifold, and um, you project them to the deck group. So you get generators for the, the deck group, and then you have some graph, and this graph is the model for your covering. That's well, not 100% right, but you can push it through sometimes. Um, so what you want to do is use some a priori that you know that there's, sorry, um, that there's expansion for this family of Cayley graphs, and then push that to get, a, to get a spectral gap for the family of Laplacian operators. Okay, so that doesn't always work, but it does work in some cases. All right, so let me just talk about where I want to go, um, some questions I'm thinking about. So these questions I talked about where you're going through covering spaces, there's a way to think about that where you're looking at this picture, so you have the big group at the top, you kill maximal compact here, and then you quotient by your fundamental group. Or you can go the other way around. So this is some like flat bundle. So if you take like representations of your fundamental group, you get like flat, flat vector bundles over x. And that fits with the picture I talked about so far, where you take representation of lambda, where you reduce mod n, and then you take the regular representation. But if you go the other way, you kill lambda first, then you have this bundle over x, which is the it's the bundle of oriented frames over X, and the, 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 the fiber is uh, SON. So for everything in the unitary dual of SON, you get some vector bundle over X. So you have this family of vector bundles over X indexed by the unitary dual of K. It comes with a connection, because um, there's, there's an Erisman connection here. Um, so you, you take the connection and it's adjoint, and you get a Laplacian. So you have a Laplacian given to you on this vector bundle when you look at the behavior of the Laplacian in this family. And then one other question that I'm interested in, but I think is very difficult, is in the compact setting, say you have a hyperbolic three manifold, how do you control low energy one forms? So the zero energy one forms are contributing to the, the cohomology of the three manifold. How, how can you control the stuff nearby to that? That's something I'm very interested in. This is related to work of uh, Bergeron and Venkatesh on um, torsion homology growth. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. <laughs>